let's begin our talk with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm Father Matthew Hanks of the Order of Canons Regular of the Holy Cross. Our religious house is located in the Diocese of Steubenville, Ohio. Before I begin this talk, I would like to thank Father Baker for the invitation to speak to your parish community about the angels. For one of the main missions of our order is to promote devotion to them. And the main way uh, we do this is in and through an organization called the Work of the Holy Angels, or Opus Angelorum, as it's called in Latin. This is a spiritual movement that has been fully recognized and approved by the Church. And it has three main missions. First, to promote not only a devotion to and a love for the holy angels, but also a close collaboration with them, as well as an imitation of their holy way of life. The second mission of the work of the holy angels is to promote de <coughs> devotion to the passion and death of Jesus. And the third mission is to pray for priests. Anyone then who might want to learn more about this apostolate can visit our website at www.opusangelorum. That's spelled O-P-U-S-A-N-G-E-L-O-R-U-M. This talk today then will be about the different ways that our guardian angel can enlighten, guide, and protect us. For you may have questions about how we can best pray to him, know him better, work with him more closely, and above all, to deepen and strengthen our friendship with him. Because there has been not only a tremendous growth of interest in the angels, but at the same time, a corresponding lack of reliable information about them. For example, if you walk into any major bookstore in the U.S. T today and go to the religious books section, we will find many books on angels, most of them, though, unfortunately, written from a New Age perspective. If we continue browsing, we will find many how-to books that can explain to us how we are able, we can develop skills in practically every area of our life, be it home improvement, cooking, mechanics, electronics, etc., but we will not be able to find, though, no matter how hard we might look, a how-to book that will concisely and simply explain to us how we can systematically grow closer to our guardian angel. So this talk today is meant to fill that gap. So what follows is a how-to guide that is organized according to a 12-step program consists of 12 things we can do which, if faithfully followed, can lead us gradually and inevitably to establish a closer friendship with our guardian angel. The first step that needs to be taken to establish this friendship is to be in the state of grace. This is, we could say, without qualification or exaggeration, the indispensable requirement for anyone who wants to go closer to their guardian angel. For we are either in the state of grace with Jesus and his holy angels, or we are in the state of mortal sin with Satan and his devils. There is no third way. There are only two armies on this battlefield. So if we turn our back on God, refuse to listen to our conscience and commit a mortal sin, our relationship with our guardian angel will be ruptured. Normal lines of communication will be cut off because our angel normally speaks to us through our conscience. And so if we refuse to listen to our conscience and commit a mortal sin, it's like hanging up the phone on our guardian angel or 
disconnecting our internet connection to his web page. We have to be aware, though, that our angel will never leave us, no matter what we might do, no matter how evil it might be, or how deeply we might fall into mortal sin and away from God. For when we fall into this state, our guardian angel, but when we fall into this state, our guardian angel's capacity to help us will be greatly reduced and limited. In effect, his hands will be tied, so to speak. Nevertheless, God can still, and sometimes will, send his send in his goodness and mercy one of his angels to help us when our life might be in great danger, for example, if we've been in a car accident, or sometimes he can give us a kind of wake-up call that would lead us to our repentance and conversion. The second step to friendship with our guardian angel is to study and learn the real truth about the angels in general and the guardian angels in particular because we can only love what we really know. And so the more that we know the real truth about the angels, then the more we will be able to grow in our love for them. And it's more important today than ever before that we try to do this because there is so much confusion and misinformation and misunderstanding about them. The New Age movement in particular is responsible for most of this confusion, because unfortunately it seems to have hijacked the general public's popular interest in angels. And so it is now spreading a lot of half-truths and downright lies about them. What's more, there is much in popular Catholic art and piety about the angels that leaves much to be desired. For example, the angels are often depicted as young women or childlike cherubs. And this can give us the false impression that the angels are soft and weak-willed persons, but at the same time that we, are human beings, are somehow superior to them in strength and intelligence. But nothing could be further from the truth. Because the angels are immensely more intelligent and more powerful than the strongest and smartest human being who has ever lived or will live. We should never underestimate then the power that they have at their disposal to help us and protect us. For they have ready to hand, we could say, power equivalent to that of an atomic bomb. And there is actual proof <coughs> of this power that can be found in the Bible, specifically in chapter 19 of the second book of Kings. For if we read this passage, we can learn that when the holy city of Jerusalem was attacked by an Assyrian army around 600 BC, the Lord sent, in answer to the prayer of King Hezekiah for protection, an angel to protect and defend the city from the attacking army. And that one angel killed in just one night 185,000 enemy soldiers. It's both interesting and significant to note here that the death toll called, caused by the first atomic bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima, Japan, 1945, was just about the same in numbers. The third step we need to take to grow closer to our guardian angel is to practice obedience to the will of God. Because the main reason that we've been given an angel in the first place is to help us both to know and do the holy will of God, just like the angels do it in heaven. So that's why we pray every day in the Our Father the words, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <clears throat> that is, like the angels do it. For this reason, the more committed we are to knowing and doing the will of God, then the more our guardian angel will be able to help us, and the more we ourselves will be able to grow closer to him. So it can be helpful here to know that there is a kind of student-teacher relationship that exists between ourselves and our guardian angel. For this reason, the more eager that we are to know and do the will of God, then the more our guardian angel will be able to help us. 
for it's just like when a student is eager to learn well and study hard. Then he can benefit greatly from the help of a good teacher. However, if a student is not really interested in learning, doesn't study or take notes, doesn't do any of the homework assignments, then no matter how good a teacher might be, then that student will not be able to profit much from the teacher's help. So in a similar way, if we care little about learning how to do God's will, then our guardian angel will not be able to help us much either. Because he will always respect our free will and won't try to force himself upon us like the devils do. On the other hand, if we make the will of God the centerpiece and the guiding star of our life, we can be certain that we will profit greatly from the help of our heavenly teacher. The fourth step on our way to greater closeness to our guardian angel is the practice of silence. Because silence is the language of God and his holy angels. Why? Well, it's because the medium is the message, we could say, and the medium by which the angels use to communicate with us is silence. So if we want to hear what they want to tell us, then we have to learn how to practice silence. For if we're always talking to other people, trying to listen to the latest news and entertainment, then we won't be able to hear that soft, <clears throat> gentle voice of our guardian angel that speaks to us in the depths of our hearts. But how does our guardian angel communicate or speak with us? How can we recognize his voice when he's trying to talk to us if he speaks in silence? <clears throat> well, the first thing we need to understand if we want to communicate with our guardian angel is that the angels speak to us for the most part, not by words, but rather by thoughts. For this reason, they will put ideas, inspirations, and intuitions into our mind, images into our imagination, and feelings into our emotion. Occasionally, though, the angels might speak to us out loud with words, like St. Gabriel spoke to Mary at the Annunciation. But this method of communication, of course, is the exception rather than the rule. And so the only way that we will be able to recognize the thoughts that our guardian angel puts into our minds from our own thoughts and the thoughts that come to us from the world, the flesh, and the devil is to spend as much time as we can in silence so that we will then be able to learn how to listen to his voice. Silence then provides the atmosphere and environment that allows us to listen to the voice of our guardian angel. So this leads us to the fifth step on our journey, which is the practice of listening. For it's only by listening in silence that we will be able to sift our thoughts, so to speak, and by doing this, come to recognize the voice of our guardian angel from the many other voices that are competing for our attention. Voices coming from the TV, radio, internet, iPhones, newspapers, magazines, etc. But before we can even begin to listen with discernment, we have to realize there's a big difference between listening and merely hearing. For example, how many times have we heard the words of the readings at Mass? But if someone were to ask us afterwards what was the responsorial psalm for the day or the theme of the gospel that was read, we might have a hard time giving a good answer to the question. So this shows us we've heard, but we really haven't listened. Because we hear with the ears that are on the outside of our head, but we listen with the ears that are inside are on the inside of our heart. <clears throat> Now, there's a little story that illustrates for us quite clearly the, distinct, the distinction that exists between these two methods of receiving information. One several men applied for the job of a telegraph operator. As they were sitting in the lobby waiting their turn to be interviewed, 
they could hear tapping sound coming from the manager's office. All the applicants ignored the sound, thinking it to be of no significance. However, all of a sudden, one of the men waiting his turn to be interviewed jumped up and strode into the manager's office without being invited to come in. All the applicants, of course, <coughs> thought that the man who did this would be shortly sent out for being so bold as to enter the office uninvited. So they were all surprised when it was announced shortly afterwards that the uninvited applicant had been hired for the job. Why? Because that tapping sound coming from the manager's office wasn't any ordinary tapping. Rather, it was the tapping of a telegraph operator's key that was tapping out the message, if you want the job, come in to the office. So this shows us that all those men that were waiting to be interviewed heard the sound, but only one really listened to it. And so too, if we want to learn about those special messages that the Lord has just for us, we have to try to spend time in silent listening every day, even if it's just for a few minutes. And this then would be an excellent sacrifice to make, especially during this coronavirus uh, lockdown. And the best place that we could choose to make this sacrifice of our time would be in a church before the Blessed Sacrament. Because as Pope, Pope St. John Paul once put it so beautifully, all the words that Jesus ever spoke or will speak are somehow contained in the silence of that little white host in the tabernacle. And it is these silent words of Jesus that only our guardian angel can magnify in such a way that we can hear what the Lord wants to tell us loud and clear. Normally then, our guardian angel will speak to us in silence by interior inspirations. But there may be other times, though, when our life or the lives of those we love might be in danger, when he will use another method of communication. In these situations, our angel may warn us by creating within us a kind of pressure or tension. We might feel then a sudden urge to pray for someone or to take some kind of emergency action. For example, how many times have we felt for some unexplainable reason that a certain person or place was dangerous and we should leave immediately? How many times have we felt that someone we love was in danger and in urgent need of prayer. <clears throat> These warning alarms then that seem to come out of nowhere are clear signals that our guardian angel is speaking to us and wants our immediate cooperation. The sixth step we need to take to grow closer to our guardian angel is to spend some time in solitude because doing this will not only deepen but at the same time improve the quality of our listening ability. For it's almost impossible to be silent or to listen well if we are always in the midst of a busy or a noisy crowd of people. What's more, it is important to seek solitude because when we are alone, the angels are somehow attracted to us and become more open and willing to communicate with us. Because it's been said by the saints that the more we keep away from friends and acquaintances, then the more the Lord and his angels will draw near to us. And a quick look at the Bible will verify for us that most angelic apparitions occurred in solitary places. For example, an angel st stayed the hand of Abraham on top of lonely Mount Moriah when he was about to kill his son Isaac. An angel appeared to Hagar in the desert when she was out of water and lost. And the only times <clears throat> that angels comforted Christ, as the Gospels tell us, were when he was in the solitude of the desert and by himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. And finally, tradition tells us that Mary was alone in the solitude of her room in 
the holy house of Nazareth when St. Gabriel appeared in Esther to become the mother of God. The seventh step that can help us to grow closer to our guardian angel is to pray to him. And the importance of doing this often and regularly can't be overestimated. For there is a kind of cause and effect relationship between how much we pray to our guardian angel and how much help we will receive from him. So in other words, the more help we pray to him, then the more help and protection we will receive. And one of the most powerful examples in recent times that proves the truth of this spiritual law took place in the life of a father, Garyon Goldman, who was a priest from Germany who served during World War II. Before his ordination to the priesthood, Father Goldman was drafted into the SS division of the German army, where he served as a medic. Toward the end of the war, he was stationed in Italy. One night, about two o'clock in the morning, he heard a voice commanding him to get up and dig. There is no time to waste. So he jumped up and looked around, but didn't see anyone. He then asked the guards if they had spoken to him or had seen anyone or anything in the area, but they hadn't. So he decided to go back to sleep, but again he heard someone commanding him, get up and dig. After these words were spoken, he felt a strange fear come over him that made him conclude that he should start digging immediately. And so at two o'clock in the morning, he began to dig a foxhole in the darkness. <clears throat> he worked at it all night and then finally finished it about nine o'clock in the morning. Shortly afterward, he looked up and then saw to his horror ten enemy planes circling his camp like vultures. They swooped down and dropped twenty bombs. Everyone was killed, of course, with the exception of Father Goldman and his driver, whom he had invited into the protection of his foxhole earlier on. Now, who warned Father Goldman in the middle of the night to begin digging that foxhole that saved his life? It was an angel, of course, but how do we know this? <clears throat> well, we know it because three weeks later, Father Goldman received a letter from a Franciscan sister who had been praying for him during the war. She told him in her letter that at two o'clock in the morning, on the very day that the airplane attack took place, that she had experienced a great fear about his safety. So she rushed to the convent chapel and then prayed continually throughout the night until morning, repeating the words, Guardian Angel, save him. Now we should notice here, first of all, that the sister was awakened quite obviously by an emergency message from her guardian angel. That is, by that internal pressure and tension that <coughs> was mentioned earlier. And so we can quite rightly conclude that Father Goldman was saved from the air raid attack because the Franciscan sister prayed with faith and devotion to her guardian angel. Now this raises the question, though, what kinds of prayer should we use when we pray to our guardian angel? We can, of course, speak to him in our own words like the Franciscan sister did, or we can make use of written prayers or litanies. Among these, the well-known guardian angel prayer is highly recommended. For not only did Padre Pio pray it every day, but Pope St. John the Twenty-Third used to pray it five, five times every day. So we can learn <clears throat> from these two great saints that no matter how holy we might become and no matter how much power and authority we might have in the church, we will never outgrow our need for praying the guardian angel prayer at least once a day. The eighth step is to pray with our guardian angel. Remember, he is a person, an individual person with a unique personality. 
a person who not only protects us, but also loves us deeply. So we can invite him to pray with us at any time of the day or night, no matter where we might be and no matter what we might doing, when we might be doing. For doing this will, without fail, increase the power and effectiveness of our prayers. Because Jesus himself has revealed, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in your midst. What's more, praying with our guardian angel can strengthen and deepen our friendship with him. <clears throat> because just as two friends can become closer when they share a common hobby, sport, or other activity and do things together, so too can we in a similar way grow closer to our guardian angel when we participate together with him in the prayer and praise of God. And this is shown in the lives of some of the great saints who had a close relationship with their guardian angel. For example, Saint Gemma Galgani. In fact, her spiritual director has described for us how she used to pray with her guardian angel. He once wrote, if Gemma and her angel were reciting vocal prayers or psalms, they did so alternately. And if they were praying invocations together, they competed with each other to see who could pray them more energetically. For example, they would say together, Viva Jesus. What's more, when it was time for meditation, her guardian angel would inspire her with beautiful words. The ninth step we can take is to send our guardian angel. First of all, we can send him to others in order to deliver messages to them and this was a practice often recommended by Padre Pio. In fact, he sometimes complained that he could hardly get any sleep at night because so many people had sent their guardian angel to him with urgent messages of one kind or another. Further, we can send our guardian angel on goodwill missions to others. In other words, we can send him as a kind of ambassador to those persons who are rather cold toward us and with whom we want to establish a better relationship so that we can help them to do God's will more effectively. And this was a practice that was highly recommended by both Pope Pius XI and Pope John XXIII. And Pope, Pope Pius has left us some detailed instructions about how and when we should send our guardian angel. He wrote, Whenever I have to speak to someone who is rather close to my arguments and with whom the conversation needs to be very persuasive, then I always recommend the matter to my guardian angel and then ask him to take it up with the person or persons I have to see. And so once the two angels establish and understanding between themselves, the conversation always goes much better. Now we should notice here that the Pope recommends that we should send our guardian angel not directly to the person we are going to meet, but rather to the guardian angel of the person we need to see. Now why does he make this distinction? He does it because our guardian angel knows us far better than we know ourselves. In fact, we could go so far as to say that no one knows us as well as our guardian angel does, <clears throat> with the exception of God and the Blessed Mother, of course, because it was God's original plan, even before he created Adam and Eve, and even before he created the angels, that we would be linked together with a special angel all of our own. For this reason, we could call our guardian angel a specialist in need. So we can be sure that the guardian angel of the person or persons we might need to comfort, console, correct, or evangelize will know not only the best approach to take with them, but also that they will know the arguments best calculated to persuade them to do God's holy will. Finally, we can send our guardian angel to protect and surround others that we might believe are in danger, like the 
Franciscan sister did for Father Goldman. Now a question often comes up here when this whole subject of sending our guardian angel is discussed, and that is, if I send my angel to someone else, won't I be left unprotected while he's out on mission? Well, we have uh, nothing to fear on this count. Even if we have to send our guardian angel halfway around the world to help someone else. For our angel can move about anywhere in the universe with the speed of thought, since he is a pure spirit and is not weighed down by a body of flesh and blood like we human beings are. What's more, our guardian angel can make his power felt at two or more places at the same time while still remaining in heaven before the face of the Father. Where St. Thomas Aquinas has pointed out, an angel is in a place by the application of his power to a particular place at a particular time and not by any kind of physical presence. And so just as I can make my presence felt at one and the same time, for example, on a lectern and on the microphone, which are actually two different places or locations while still remaining stationary, so too, in a similar way, can the angels make their presence felt, not only by our side, but also, too, at the same time, anywhere else in the world. The range of an angel's power is not infinite, of course, as God's is, but nevertheless, we could safely assume that the range of our guardian angel's power extends to everywhere else on earth. The tenth step that can help us to deepen our friendship with our guardian angel is fasting. For fasting, as St. Athanasius has pointed out, is the life of the angels. And so if we dedicate ourselves to fasting, we will be able to somehow enter into the ranks of the angels and participate with them in their life of praise and adoration. This time of the coronavirus can be a time for beginning a program of fasting if we're, we don't, if we're not already practicing one. So we can grow in our love for God and also at the same time grow in our knowledge and love of our guardian angel. For fasting can make us more open to the inspirations that come to us through his holy hands, since fasting can purify both our mind and our body from those things that can interfere with the reception of the messages that he sends us. What's more, when we try to imitate the life of our guardian angel by fasting, since he never eat, needs to eat, he cannot but be pleased, because, as we know, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. For this reason, as we can learn from several different episodes in the Bible, fasting can attract the help and the protection of the angels. For example, angels delivered the law and the commandments to Moses after he had made a 40-day fast on top of Mount Sinai. And St. Gabriel appeared to the prophet Daniel after he had made a three-week fast, not only to strengthen and encourage him, but also to explain to him the prophecies about the coming of the Messiah. And finally, remember that the angels ministered to Jesus himself after he had finished his 40-day fast in the desert. Further, besides attracting the help of the angels, the holy angels, fasting has the opposite effect on the devils, that is, it drives them away. For St. John Vianney has stated, there's absolutely nothing that the devils fear more than fasting. And as Pope St. John Paul has written in his encyclical on life, the most powerful weapons against the forces of evil are prayer and fasting. The eleventh step that we can take that will help us to deepen and strengthen our devotion to our guardian angel, and maybe the most important one, is to have a devotion to Mary, Queen of the Angels, for she is not only Queen of Heaven and the angels and the saints, but also she is our Queen and Mother, too. And so, just like the good mother of a large family, wants to see that all of her children get along well together, so too does Mary want us to be 
on good terms with the angels, whom we could consider to be our elder brothers in the family of God. What's more, besides helping us to establish a better relationship with our guardian angel, Mary can also, because she is the queen and commander of the angels, send us the help of additional angels whenever we are strongly attacked or tempted by the devil or other evil forces. Because just as an experienced general knows how and when to send out additional troops when his army is under heavy attack, so too in a similar way does Mary know the best and most effective way to send additional angels whenever we are heavily besieged by the world, the flesh, and the devil. The twelfth step is to thank our guardian angel for all the help, guidance, and protection he has not only given to us, but continues to give us every day of our life. For our guardian angel is one of, if not the greatest gift that God has given to us. For he has been matched with us from all eternity in order to help us carry out that special mission that <clears throat> we have been created to accomplish. For this reason, no one knows this better than our guardian angel does, again, without the exception of God himself. What's more, we could say, as Padre Pio has pointed out, that no one loves us more than our guardian angel. Yet most of us, sad to say, are scarcely aware of this great gift to say nothing about our duty to give thanks for receiving it. Our lack of appreci appreciation for and our failure to express our gratitude not only to God for giving us a guardian angel, but also to our guardian angel himself, could be compared to receiving the gift of a brand new Mercedes and then locking it up in the garage and forgetting about it. Just think then of how much more we could grow in our love for God and our neighbor and how much more we could grow in holiness if we simply thanked our guardian angel more often. Finally, the culmination of these steps is the making of a consecration to our guardian angel. For by doing this, we can unlock the power that he has at his disposal to help us more effectively and to guide us more securely. For the consecration allows him to penetrate our minds more deeply and to strengthen our wills more powerfully, while at the same time allowing us to gain something of his heavenly perspective on our earthly life and daily duties. The consecration allows us then to be lifted up into the work and the world of the holy angels. To sum up then, when we consecrate ourselves to our guardian angel, we establish a closer bond and a deeper friendship with him. In effect, we allow him the freedom to exercise a greater influence over our life. For this reason, once we have made the consecration our guardian angel will be able to give us greater light and strength than he has ever done before. Now, anyone who might want to sign up for the consecration program to the guardian angel that our order sponsors and supervisors could go to our webpage at www.opusangelorum where you will find the necessary contact information. To conclude this talk today, if we faithfully and prayerfully follow each one of these 12 steps, we will be able to develop a truly living friendship with our guardian angel, and then he will become for us not just some mysterious presence, but rather he will become a true friend, and not just any kind of friend, but our best friend, a friend who will be ready and willing to help us in all our needs no matter how big or small they might be at any time of the day or night, and no matter where we are or what we might be doing. But this cannot be done, of course, without prayer and lots of it. So today let's make the first step in doing this by praying, Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love commits me here, ever this day be at my side, to light and guard, to rule and guide. Amen. Father and the Son.